Well, thank you so much, Anne. I, I want to say what a great pleasure it is, what a great honor it is uh, to be with you this morning and to share some of the thoughts that I've uh, been kind of developing in the past several years respecting one of my favorite parts of the world. Uh, my discussion today is about India's Deccan Plateau, uh, <clears throat> and more particularly, the contrasts between its northern and southern halves. So this up here, of course, is the Indo-Gangetic Plain, or Hindustan. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the plateau, which really is the peninsula, except for the very southern part. So this is the, the midsection uh, that we are going to be focusing on here. And my aim is to stimulate discussion about how geographic space and culture are related to each other. Let me get this on here. <clears throat> For many years, indeed centuries, scholars and the general public across the planet have projected civilization, ideology, or religion onto space. Think of such common terms as Western civilization, Christendom, the motherland, the free world, the Middle Kingdom, the Promised Land, the Third World, there are many others. But such projections have unfortunate consequences, such as seen in Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. In his mapping of the world, one and only one civilization occupied any given national territory thereby excluding the possibility of cultural diversity anywhere. <clears throat> in India, for example, is designated in orange color, or saffron color, and hence Hindu. I mean, you would never know from this map that India is the third largest Muslim country in the world. <clears throat> uh, clearly, Huntington's clash of civilizations model flies in the face of how cultural systems anywhere actually interpenetrate one another and how they became dispersed over the planet. Writing in the 1960s, a much more sophisticated scholar, Marshall Hodgson, tried to theorize cultural zones like India that were far from the Middle East, yet seemed to share in aspects of Islamic culture. And for this purpose, he coined the word Islamicate. For him, this term referred to those parts of the world that were inspired by a certain material, literary, and aesthetic sensibility, even if they did not have a majority Muslim population. As Hodgson wrote, by the 16th century, most of the East Christian, Hindu, and Theravada Buddhist peoples found themselves more or less enclaved in an Islamicate world where Muslim standards of taste commonly made their way even into independent kingdoms like Hindu Vijayanagara and Norman Sicily." Unquote. Now, by citing Vijayanagara and Sicily, Hodgson signaled that he was referring to something very different from conventional understandings of the, quote, Muslim world. After all, a Hindu ruling class governed the South Indian state of Vijayanagara here. Christians governed Sicily here, and neither one had many resident Muslims. So by coining the adjective Islamicate, which refers to particular attributes, and by coining the term Islamdom, which refers to the displacement of those attributes onto territory, Hodgson wanted to theorize a much larger region than the more restricted Muslim world. Hodgson also recognized a fluidity of culture that was entirely missed in static understandings of civilization, such as Huntington's scheme here. But the problem is that the word Islamicate contains the word Islam, suggesting that the term might have some connection with the Muslim religion. Whereas what Hodgson actually had in mind with Islamicate were structures such as former government buildings in Vijayanagara, which had nothing to do with the Islamic religion, but which just happened to have pointed arches, domes, or vaulted arcades. Another reason he included Vijayanagara in his notion of Islamdom, he writes, is that the city's rulers 
used Islamic fashions in its court. Now here he seems to have meant articles of clothing, such as the kola, a tall Persian headgear worn across the Persian-speaking world. He was also referring to the vaulted domes and the pointed arches found on monuments such as Vijayanagara's famous elephant stables, uh, <clears throat> which you see here, uh, right in the heart of Vijayanagara. On the other hand, for many years, art historians refused to believe that another structure at Vijayanagara, 15th century self-styled Hall of Dharma, or Dharmsale, was actually a mosque, even though the structure faced Mecca, bore an inscription identifying its patron as one Ahmed Khan, and most crucially, it had on its uh, Mecca-facing wall a prayer niche, or mihrab. The structure was therefore undeniably a mosque. But modern art historians had so thoroughly associated Persian architecture with Islam that they could not imagine that this thoroughly tribiated structure, lacking vaulting, domes, or arches, might actually have been a mosque. So instead, until very recently, they identified it as a mandapa, that is to say, a pillared hall associated with Hindu temples. In effect, then, rather than Vijayanagara being enclaved in an Islamic world, as Hudson had imagined, what we actually see are properly Islamic structures like this mosque being enclaved in an Indian world. Whereas royal structures of metropolitan Vijayanagara, with their lavish use of arches, vaults, and domes, had been absorbed into something quite different, what I would call a trans-regional and trans-confessional Persian world. In short, the Deccan Plateau proved to be an extremely problematic part of the world for scholars uh, of many varieties to theorize. Just as Huntington saw the Dardanelles as a deep and impermeable, impermeable civilizational frontier separating Western civilization from the world of Islam, for historians throughout the 20th century, the Krishna River, running through the middle of the Deccan, formed a similar such civilizational frontier, something like a sort of cultural Maginot line. To the north, from the 14th through the 17th centuries, lay the Bahmani kingdom and its successor sultanates, all of them ruled by Muslims. And to the south lay the kingdom of Vijayanagara. In contrast to Hudson, who included this state in what he calls Islamdom, the English historian Robert Sewell, writing back in the year 1900, characterized Vijayanagara as a, quote, Hindu bulwark against Muslim encroachments from the north. Now, this characterization prevailed throughout the 20th century and continues into the present, owing largely to the Indian nationalist movement, which looked back for a properly Hindu kingdom in pre-colonial Indian history that might serve as a model for post-colonial Republic of India. Since the Mughal Empire obviously would not do, since it was ruled by Muslims, Hindu nationalists understood Vijayanagara largely as precisely as Sewell described it, namely a Hindu bulwark against Islam. But there are problems with Sewell's understanding. For example, what can one make of Hindu monarchs who adopted Persian personal names, Arabic titles, Turco-Arab garments, and Iranian notions of statecraft? In fact, the remarkable similarities between the states that emerged on both sides of the Krishna River between the 14th and 17th centuries would appear to refute any notion that this river formed any kind of marginal line between Hindus and Muslims. Consider the moral economy. All across India, not just the Deccan, states espoused ideals found in the Mirror for Kings literature well known to students of medieval Persian history. Listen to the words of the early 13th century theorist from Herat in Western Afghanistan, Fakhradin Razi, writing in 1209. Wealth is gathered from, from the subjects. The subjects are made servants by justice. Justice is the axis of the prosperity of the world. And here is a verse quoted from the Telugu work, Badaniti, a popular work on 
royal conduct and statecraft composed in the Eastern Deccan way back in the 12th century, that is, before the, before the conquest of the region by Turkish Muslims. To acquire wealth, make the people prosper. To make the people prosper, justice is the means. O Kirti Narayana, they say that justice is the treasury of kings. Now, both extracts present a conceptual linkage between wealth, subjects, and justice, forming a unified, coherent political ideology. Since no comparable statement on governance can be found in classical Sanskrit texts, it seems that such an idea of the state's proper moral economy became current in the subcontinent only after the rise of Indo-Muslim rule in North India. But since the Telugu extract we see here appeared before the Turkish conquest of the Deccan, we have to assume that ruling elites in the Deccan had consciously assimilated such ideas, evidently wishing to associate themselves with what they considered a cosmopolitan world that was both transregional and prestigious. Such ideas also formed an ideological counterpart to the assimilation of material culture, such as the high conical headgear made of brocaded fabric known in Telugu as the kulai, a term derived from the Persian word kula, or the long, or the long tunic known in Telugu as kabai, which is derived from the Arabic word kaba. By the 14th century, Deccan states on both sides of the Krishna River had also evolved similar political economies. The ikta, or the land assignment a ruler conferred on his nobles, had been introduced, introduced to northern India from Central Asia by Turks of the Ghaznavid dynasty in the 11th century. By the 13th century, the idea of the ikta, known in the Deccan as Nayamkara, had appeared in state systems throughout the pre-conquest Deccan. Both the ikta and the Nayamkara referred to a distinctive kind of land tenure that linked a state's revenue system to its armed forces since nobles were required to maintain a specific number of troops that corresponded to the size of their land assignment. Then too, on both sides of the Krishna, we find a shared terminology for the head of state. In 1347, the same year that the Bahmani King Sultanate was established in the Northern Deccan, one of the five brothers who launched the kingdom of Vijayanagara styled himself Hindu Raya Suratrama, which translates as Sultan among Indian kings. A few years later, two of his brothers, who co-ruled the kingdom, were praised with the same title. Thereafter, the kings of the state were regularly styled Sultan, including the most famous and powerful of the kings, Krishnaraya, whom you see here in the bas relief. Assimilation of the term Sultan by Hindu monarchs suggests, if nothing else, that the term was understood as functionally detached from the Islamic religion. Ever since the 8th century, religious authority had been invested in the caliph, but after the Mongols abolished the office of the caliph in 1258, that authority was displaced among thousands of holy men, or Sufis, scattered across the Muslim world. But in the eastern, Persian-speaking part of that world, meaning the Iranian plateau in Central Asia, Religious and political authority had been functionally separated. In those regions, political authority was invested in Turkish rulers who from around the year 1000 began styling themselves sultans and claiming to rule over all the subjects residing in their kingdoms, regardless of their religious or ethnic identities. In effect, we see a functional separation of church and state that appeared in the Persian-speaking world long before it would appear in Europe. Detached from the Islamic religion, the title Sultan became a mobile and freely available term that, being powerful and prestigious as well as non-religious, could be appropriated by any aspiring ruler of any religion in the Persian and Indian worlds. This is why it was claimed not just by rulers of major states like Vijayanagara, but even by minor players, such as Kapaya Nayaka, a Telugu chieftain who successfully rebelled against the Delhi Sultanate in 1367. In that year, he styled himself Andhra Suratala, or the Sultan of Andhra, which is to say the Eastern Deccan. The diffusion across the entire Deccan plateau of the term Sultan of the Iqtas system of land tenure 
of shared ideas of moral economy, of headgear and tunics associated with Iran, and of architectural features such as arches, domes, and ribbed vaulting. All of these can be explained historically. Both the Bahmani Sultan in the north and Vijayanagara in the south had arisen after successfully overthrowing uh, the, the, the domination of the Delhi Sultanate, which therefore functioned like a, a, a kind of a parent dynasty for both states. And it was prior service in the Delhi Sultanate that helped confer political authority and legitimacy on the founders of both the Bahmani and Vijayanagara states. Nor was it just ideas of moral economy, royal terminology, architectural features, or headgear that freely drifted across the Krishna River. So did people. The kings of Vijayanagara are known to have recruited thousands of Muslim cavalry and troops, together with Turco-Persian techniques of warfare, into their state's military system. An entire quarter of the capital city of Vijayanagara was occupied by Turco-Indian Muslim troops. We even see statues of figures riding fantastic animals and, and guarding Hindu temples in Vijayanagara. The pointed beards and caps identify these figures as Turks, and so presumably Muslim. Such figures make sense if we recognize that the state of Vijayanagara recruited Muslim Turks on account of their reputation as fierce fighters. But it makes no sense if we see the northern and southern Deccan as implacably divided between a Muslim north and a Hindu south. Today, the idea of Muslims guarding a Hindu temple would appear simply absurd. However, if the Bahmani and Vijayanagara states shared similar political rights, having arisen from simultaneous rebellions across the, uh, against their overlords of Delhi, they differed vastly in how they legitimized their claims to rule. For the Bahmanis, as with other former provinces of the Delhi Sultanate, the blessings of a Sufi sheikh was considered essential for ensuring a new state's prosperity and legitimacy. According to Deccani sources, Delhi's most renowned Sufi, Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia, had effectively lent his blessings to the Bahmani enterprise, even though the state would not emerge until several decades after his death. In an anecdote current in the Deccan in the late 1500s, the sheikh had just finished meeting with the Delhi Sultan at the sheikh's lodge when he found Zafar Khan, the future founder of the Bahmani Sultanate. He was waiting outside. One sultan has left my door, the sheikh remarked. Another one is waiting there. This anecdote illustrates a theme, the theme of an eminent Sufi sheikh predicting future kingship for some political figure, with that prediction serving as a veiled form of that figure's appointment to royal power. For in the discourse of Sufism, sovereign authority was understood as held by spiritually powerful sheikhs. In the words of Isami, a contemporary chronicler who witnessed the launching of the Bahmani state, quote, although there might be a monarch in every country, yet it is actually under the protection of a fakir, that is a Sufi, unquote. So following this logic, such sheikhs effectively leased political sovereignty to kings and charged them with the messy business of worldly governance, while the sheikhs themselves withdrew to a life of austerity spiritual discipline, and teaching. However, a sheikh's prediction of kingship was no guarantee of a sultanate's well-being. Independent rulers in the Deccan needed a continuing legitimacy made possible by a resident sheikh, preferably descended spiritually from Nizamuddin Olia. Isame recorded that with that sheikh's death in 1325, the city and empire of Delhi had sunk into desolation, tyranny, and turmoil. But the Deccan, he maintained, suffered no such fate. Rather, the Deccan had prospered thanks to the radiant, beneficent presence of one of Nizamuddin's leading disciples, Burhanuddin, Burhanuddin Gharib, who had migrated down to Dalatabad in 1329. When Burhanuddin died in 1337, that protective presence passed on to his leading disciple, Sheikh Zainuddin Shirazi, 
by whose actions the newly launched Bahmani state was transformed from a rebel movement to a legitimate Indo-Islamic kingdom. The very robe worn by the Prophet Muhammad on the night of his ascension to paradise, a robe subsequently passed on through 23 generations of holy men until finally received by Zainuddin, that robe was allegedly bestowed upon Zafar Khan when he was crowned king in 1347. Sufi sheikhs were therefore fundamental in diffusing sultanate systems in the Deccan, as elsewhere in India. Whereas earlier invasions of the Deccan by the rulers of Delhi had lacked any moral basis, being undertaken simply for plunder or tribute, the extension of the Sufis' notion of spiritual sovereignty lent moral legitimacy to newly established states. No longer available for plunder with impunity, the territory of such states, its people, its produce, and its fixed assets, including Hindu temples, now merited state protection. In classical Islamic discourse, the presence and blessings of a great Sufi sheikh could, can, could transform yesterday's abode of war, Dar al-Harb, into today's abode of peace, Dar al-Islam, thereby bringing about an internally coherent logic for the transplanting of legitimate Indo-Muslim rulership from one region to another within South Asia. As vessels into which divine favor was believed to have been poured, great sheikhs exercised a quasi-political dominion over the lands in which they resided. Therefore, if Sheikh Burhanuddin Gharib's arrival in, in Dolalabad, in the Deccan, had inaugurated Delhi's legitimate rule in the Deccan, legitimate independent rule there only began when Zainuddin Shirazi bestowed that robe of the Prophet onto the Bahmani first king, 1347. Meanwhile, to the south of the Krishna River, the new state of Vijayanagara asserted very different claims to legitimate rule. Its authority was based on a goddess cult that had emerged as early as the seventh century on the southern banks of the Tungabhadra River, a major tributary of the Krishna River, you see in the, in the map. At that time, the site was simply known as Pampas Tirtha, or the crossing of the, river, uh, of the river goddess Pampa, where passing chieftains would halt and make votive offerings during military campaigns. By the ninth century, the first stone temple had appeared at this site, dedicated evidently to this goddess. By the early 11th century, donations at the site were being made to the male deity Mahakaladeva, who was a violent aspect of Shiva. By the 12th century, a temple complex dedicated to Virupaksha, who represented Shiva's more universal and benign aspect, had emerged at the site. Unlike the earlier phase, when she was merely protected by Mahakaladeva, to whom she was in no way a subordinate, the river goddess Pampa was now reduced to a subordinate status as Shiva's consort. At the same time, South Indian texts had begun describing Pampa's marriage to Virapaksha in terms paralleling the all India story of Shiva's marriage to the goddess Parvati. So in this way, over the course of 500 years, a regional shrine had gradually become Sanskritized as a local river goddess was pulled up into and transformed by the big world of pan-Indian Shiva worship. At the same time, the site grew ever more important as a pilgrimage center. From the 13th century on, politically ambitious or already dominant rulers in the area had begun cultivating closer ties with the shrine and its deities, whereas in earlier days, only passing chieftains had done so. Around 1327, five brothers, the Sagama brothers, proclaimed themselves to be the site's protectors. And when those chieftains established their capital at the site, which is by then called Vijayanagara, or City of Victory, their family deity, Virapaksha, was elevated to the status of state deity. A succession of Sangama kings heaped lavish architectural patronage on this temple complex by the banks of the Tungabhadra uh, River. You see it here. Hundreds of copper plate inscriptions recording land grants contain a phrase stating that the donation was carried out, quote, in the presence of Virapaksha on the banks of the Tungabhadra. And they conclude with a large signature of the god Sri Virapaksha 
written in Kannada script. So you see here a copper plate with the inscription in Sanskrit above. It kind of tells you the business part of the, 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 uh, the grant, you know, who gets what land, where. And at the very bottom, you see here in a clearly different script, in Kannada script, not Sanskrit, uh, the name Virapaksha, as if the god Virapaksha had authorized this document by signing his signature at the bottom, indicating that the state was really, the, the real uh, sovereign of the state was the god Virapaksha. As owner of all state land within the kingdom, the deity in this way participated uh, in formal transactions, attested to their validity, and asserted his sovereign rule over the state. From the moment of its launching then, the state of Vijayanagara was a culturally hybridized kingdom. Its ruling institutions, its architecture, and its wider trans-regional posture suggest a desire to assimilate the ideals and the idioms of the greater Persianate world. On the other hand, its religious origins and legal foundations were embedded in a state cult focused on a local form of a trans-regional god who underwrote the state's claims to legitimate authority. But there is no evidence that these contrasting strategies of state legitimacy led to polarized notions of an Islamic and Hindu, of Islamic and Hindu civilizations of the Deccan, or that there was a religious basis for the endemic hostility, hostility between the two states. Rather, that hostility seems to have derived from fierce competition over control of one of the wealthiest strips of land in the entire peninsula, the so-called Raichur Doab, uh, which lay directly between the two states and flows right along that blue line, which is the Krishna River. This hostility generated and sustained a rhetoric of mutual demonization. <clears throat> Inscriptions or chronicles patronized by Brahmins <clears throat> in, in Vijayanagara stigmatized their state enemies as adharmic, that is, not conforming to order in the sense of social and cosmic harmony. North of the Krishna River, meanwhile, Iranian immigrants to the Bahmani kingdom stigmatized the people of Vijayanagara as coffers or infidels. Now, a good way to understand the actual relations between the powers, apart from rhetoric, uh, is to look at visual evidence and to combine the perspectives of both political history and art history. These two disciplines perfectly converge when one studies the roles played by city gates. It was the art historian Oleg Grabar, who in his landmark study, The Formation of Islamic Art, who drew attention to an important category of early Islamic art that he called victory monuments. Uh, <clears throat> Whether taking the form of a painting, a sculpture, or a building, these monuments expressed, as Grabar put it, quote, the rule of a land or an area by a culture, or even the simple presence in a land of an alien or new element through some visual perceptible form, unquote. We can see Grabar's ideas played out in two mutually hostile kingdoms in the 16th century. Vijayanagara to the north, of the Krishna River, uh, I'm sorry, Vijayanagara to the south of the, of the Krishna River, and to the north, the Sultanate of Bijapur, one of five successor states to the Bahmani Kingdom. In particular, the gates of forts that were hotly contested by Bijapur and Vijayanagara show how these two states express their self images as well as their mutual hostility. Certainly, among the most public site in any pre modern Indian city was the principal entrance gate leading to its citadel. Used for ceremonial purposes as well as ordinary public traffic, public gateways projected the dynasty's public persona to all visitors, whether exalted or humble. Few gateways of metropolitan Vijayanagara remain standing today, with the exception of this well-preserved structure, which lies to the southeast of what has been called the royal center of Vijayanagara. This gate has a distinctively Persianate feel to it, owing, owing to its dome and its pointed arch. The reach for the contemporary international style that we see here perfectly aligns with other structures in the city's royal center, such as this vaulted arcade 
leading to the so-called elephant stables and their domed roofs, which you see here in the background. Now, it's useful to, con to contrast the Vijanagara gateway that we just saw with the principal gateway of their adversary to the north, Bijapur, under the Adil Shahi dynasty of sultans. Bijapur's capital had two rings of walls, one encircling the citadel, the green you see in the center, and the other encircling the entire city, the outside. But the citadel had only one gate, which is by far the most important entranceway in the fort, since it leads directly to the royal palaces. The gateway complex dates to the reign of Ibrahim I in the mid-16th century and consists of an outer gate leading to an outer courtyard and then an inner gateway leading to a smaller, more intimate courtyard. The opening of the outer gate, you see here, features a pointed arch in the same international Persianate style as we just saw at Vijanagara. But something very different happens when we move from the outer to the inner gate. First, although it is no longer there today, until the early 20th century, an inscription written in the Kannada language and dated 1074, it's a thousand years ago, was embedded in a wall just in front of the entrance. It was issued by one of the most famous emperors of the, of the Chalukya Empire, Somoshvara II, who ruled from 1068 to 1076. Here we see a translation of that inscription, which was issued at the height of power and glory of the Chalukya Empire nearly a thousand years ago. In modern memory and scholarship, the Chalukyas are vastly overshadowed by their contemporaries and bitter enemies, the Cholas, who are much better known and whose extraordinary monuments and sculpture seem to suck all the oxygen out of South Indian scholarship. I hate, hate to say this, I'm, I'm very sorry, but here we have, uh, uh, you've, you've all seen these temples. This is a typical Chola temple and an example of their very fine work, uh, also in bronze sculpture, such as this, this famous Nataraja. You've all seen this as well. Uh, <clears throat> but the, uh, this uneven attention given to the Cholas and Chalukyas is very unfortunate, in my view, in light of the very fine artistic achievements of the lesser-known Chalukyas. Now, here are some examples of their work, all dating to the 11th and 12th centuries. I'm just going to run you by some of the extraordinarily very different uh, style and, and, and feeling you get from these uh, Chalukya temples from the Chola. And you especially want to admire these, these highly polished columns, uh, extraordinary columns uh, found in, these, in the interior of this. And the, the Cholas never did anything like this, I have to say. Uh, just running you through some of the, the kinds of uh, monuments, the, the sculpture. Uh, that appears on, as, as part of these monuments. That was southern part of Chalukya. Now the northern part is a somewhat different style, uh, but, but you'll still see the, the, uh, the rather delicate uh, the aesthetics that are, that are found in these temples uh, that uh, the date uh, to the 11th and 12th centuries. So returning to Bijapur, here we are back in Bijapur, that Chalukya inscription in Bijapur's principal gateway shows that the memory of that dynasty's prestige, though dormant for a long time, three or 400 years, had come back in the 16th century in a, a full four centuries after the dynasty had, had disappeared. The inscription records the establishment of a Shiva temple in the Chalukya city of Vijayapura, which of course is today's Bijapur. Situated in a highly visible part of the most prominent gateway in the capital, it seems that the inscription was intended to invoke the memory of a long lost but prestigious dynasty with which the sultans of Bijapur, the Muslim sultans of Bijapur, wished to identify. In fact, this inscription was just one sign of the Chalukya's silent but continuing presence at the court of Bijapur. Passing through the inner gate, one encounters now a forest of Chalukya period columns that Sultan Ibrahim I repositioned in the inner courtyard. That is, he took columns that were just lying around, been around for four or five hundred years, and put them right in the heart of his central entrance to the, to the, uh, to the, to the citadel. Only 14 of these remain today. You can see here's a photograph taken back in 1957. 
At that time, there were 24 columns, divided in two groups of 12 each. Visitors to Bijapur could hardly miss the dynasty's deliberate invocation of its Chalukya past. Curiously enough, and perhaps not at all coincidental, the chronological gap between the collapse of the Chalukya and the height of its revival four centuries later is approximately the same as the gap between the collapse of the Roman Empire and the reign of Charlemagne. As we know, Charlemagne consciously revived memories of imperial Rome with which he identified himself. And like the sultans of Bijapur, he did so by transplanting columns associated with a classical age into the heart of his own new kingdom. Not long after Sultan Ibrahim built the gateway to his citadel, Chalukya art also adorned a small gate gateway called a postern that pierced the fort's outer wall. So here we have the outer wall, and if you notice on the bottom, in the blue, uh, we have this uh, much smaller kind of gate. And as we know from a Persian inscription that used to lie above the, this gateway, in 1568, a Brahmin named Baid Pandaji patronized this gate's construction. And in doing so, he placed above its opening a Chalukya period Marka uh, Makara Tornana, which is a carving of a fabulous crocodile. You see here, it's a close-up. Now, since the inscription mentions the Sultan's name, we can be certain that this gateway was built with the approval of the Sultan. So we are left with a curious contrast in the gateways of these two great capital cities. In the so-called Muslim dynasty ruling over the northern Deccan, Sultan Ibrahim made an explicit association with an earlier trans-regional cosmopolitan dynasty, the Chalukyas, uh, that were deeply rooted, of course, in Indic cultural traditions. It was, if you wish, a purely Hindu dynasty. At the same time, the best preserved gateway of the so-called Hindu city of Vijayanagara to the south invoked a more recent cosmopolitan spirit rooted in Persian cultural traditions. Both cities appear to have seized motifs that would link them to something larger than themselves. Bijapur did so by reaching back in time to the Chalukyas, while Vijayanagara did so by reaching across contemporary space to associate itself with the Persian world. Significantly, the gateways of neither capital exhibited hostility toward each other. The situation is very different, though, when we look at the gateways and of other structures in other cities that lay between Vijayanagara and Bijapur, especially in the rich floodplain of Raichur Doab. These are the forts, some of them hill forts, others plains forts, that Bijapur and Vijayanagara bitterly contested, over which they fought major wars. They also changed hands several times, a phenomenon clearly revealed in both architectural and written evidence. One of these cities is Adoni, you see on the map here, a hill fort located about 60 miles east of Vijayanagara. The fort is situated on a rocky plateau high above the surrounding plain. And from the high scarp surrounding it, one quickly sees why Adoni was so difficult for besiegers to take. One of the fort's most enigmatic monuments is what appears, from the back at least, it appears to be a ruined temple. But on closer inspection, we see that the structure that projects outward in the, in the middle of the back wall you see here is not large enough or deep enough to accommodate a temple sanctum. Looking at the structure's front side, on the other hand, it is clear that this was in fact a mosque, albeit a mosque that is in very bad shape today as is obvious when you look straight through to the mihrab, as we're doing here. Originally founded some, sometime in the first half of the 16th century, when Adoni was under Vijayanagara's control, the mosque was evidently intended to serve the Muslims among Vijayanagara's soldiers who manned this garrison. For as I mentioned earlier, we know that Vijayanagara recruited many thousands of Turks, Turkish cavalry, as their troops. The mosque therefore conformed to the local styles used for small temples and mosques at the Vijayanagara capital. 
This included such features as post and lintel construction, you see it here, uh, with columns built in a style typical of northern Deccan temples, flat ceilings, plain uh, ma uh, mason walls that were carried on a molded plinth. The mosque's structural elements therefore compare with buildings like Amir Khan's Dharmsala, we talked about earlier, which is located in the Muslim quarter of metropolitan Vijayanagara. But with this difference, Amir Khan's mosque had been built back in 1439, long before peoples of either side of the Krishna were consciously reviving memories of Chalukya glory. Therefore, the Amir Khan mosque exhibits the simple, rather crude, basalt columns taken from local quarries. And these columns you see here are obviously nothing to brag about. They're, just, they're, they're made from sandstone, uh, local quarries, uh, and they're not very spectacular. The Adoni Mosque, on the other hand, was built around a century later at the time when the Chalukya revival was in full swing. This is seen in the four smooth and finely carved Chalukya columns made from local quarries of schist, which is a fine-grained metamorphic stone having a darker blue-green color. These columns are given the place of honor, these four columns, gracing the center of the mosque. And supporting the structure's perimeter, on the other hand, you look in the, to the back of this slide, are ordinary columns carved in the local Vijayanagara style from gray-colored basalt. Apparently, builders were not able to obtain enough Chalukya columns to be used throughout the structure. This sort of thing is also found in metropolitan Vijayanagara itself. We're, here we are back at the, the, the main temple, the Virupaksha temple. And looking at the, the great mandapa directly across from this temple, uh, which is dedicated to Shiva, uh, we see a similar disposition of architectural labor. You look at the bottom half of the slide, fine Chalukya columns are carved from darker schist are reserved for the most visible space, which is the ground level, while basalt columns, or sandstone, being cheaper and easier to obtain and locally cut in Vijayanagara style, these are used for the upper floor, which would not be as visible from the ground as the lower level. So here are these chalukya columns on the lower level, very finely carved. But here the plot thickens. Around 1568, several years after the Battle of Talakota, in which Metropolitan Vijayanagara was largely destroyed by a coalition of northern sultanates of which Bijapur was part, Bijapur's army successfully besieged Adoni Fort and marked its annexation by making fundamental changes in this local mosque. One of, the, one of their aims appears to have been to erase the mosque's earlier association with Vijayanagara. And for this purpose, they plastered over the crude basalt pillars that the Vijayanagara builders had used to support the structure's outer perimeter. So here we see the, the plaster that was used to cover up those columns. Closer up, same thing. At the same time, they gave the outer facade a complete facelift. Just as the original style of the mosque had emulated the style of metropolitan Vijayanagara, like that Amir Khan mosque you saw, uh, Bijapur's uh, addition exhibited a local version of the style of metropolitan uh, Bijapur based on that dynasty's signature vocabulary that you see here, piers and arches, bracketed eaves, and carved stucco. By updating the mosque's facade, this facelift, and by modifying its Vijayanagara interior, in fact, disguising it, the Sultan's builders were able to partially obscure the original Vijayanagara fabric of the mosque, thus erasing a conspicuous trace of the fort's earlier political affiliation and asserting its new position within the wider Bijapur world. The essential point here is that this is not a case of the victorious Bijapuris triumphantly transforming a Vijayanagara temple into an Agilshari or Bijapuri mosque. Archaeological evidence shows that the structure had never been a temple in the first place. Yet ironically, the original mosque, that is the structure designed by Vijayanagara's rulers, had conformed so closely to the style of Vijayanagara's temples that in modern times, militant Hindus, 
I'm talking about the last several decades, militant Hindus have mistakenly imagined that the Sultan had destroyed a Hindu temple before building a mosque in its place. They therefore tore down the minarets that Bijapur had added to its facade. And broken pieces of those minarets can still be seen lying around uh, on the ground in front of you right here. Tombs in the mosque's courtyard were also desecrated. In their 1990 book, Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them, uh, Arun Shori and Sitaram Goel erroneously include this mosque as an instance of temple desecration by pre-modern Muslims. But in fact, it is a case of a mosque des desecration by modern-day Hindus. In reality, the structure's religious identity as a mosque had never changed. What had been a mosque under Vijayanagara's rule remained a mosque under Bijapur's rule. All that had changed was its dynastic affiliation, modifying its facade with just enough visual cues to align the mosque stylistically with Metropolitan Bijapur instead of Metropolitan Vijayanagara, the Sultan gave public and visual notice of the presence of a new ruling power in this region of India. This underscores the point made by Oleg Grabar, namely that changing political contexts can profoundly shape the appearance of a city's most public sites, owing to a political need to appropriate land by manipulating visual symbols. Now this point is made abundantly clear if we examine the gateways of another fort, namely Raichur, not far away. Lying in the rich floodplain between Bijapur and Vijayanagara, this fort was repeatedly contested by the powers of southern and northern Deccan. The fort's earliest history is seen today in the two great walls that encircle this fort. The earliest walls were built by the Kakatiya dynasty of Hindu kings back in 1296. When the Babanese uh, seized this, this region, this is the earlier wall, uh, in 1469, they built a higher and larger wall, complete with a moat uh, that encircled the earlier Kakatiya walls. In 1520, there was a serious dispute between Vijayanagara's ruler, Krishnaraya, and the ruler of Bijapur, Ismail Adil Khan. To resolve their dispute, Krishnaraya took an enormous army to, to Raichur here, besieged the city's eastern side, and conquered the fort. Its courtyard was transferred uh, from it, it, its, its control, rather, was transformed from Bijapur to, uh, to Vijayanagara. In the course of the siege, the city's primary gate, the Kati Darbaza, was completely destroyed. You see that on the eastern side of the, of, the, of the slide before you. Most of what we see today is what Krishnaraya rebuilt in 1520, immediately following the conquest of the fort. The best preserved part of Krishnaraya's intervention is the southern gatehouse in the Kati Darwaza, so-called Kati Darwaza. But we can imagine that, uh, what the old Bahmani Kati Darwaza must have looked like since its companion gate on Raichur's western side, the Mecca Darwaza, built at the same time as the Kati Gate, still stands today, bearing the characteristically Bahmani pyramid dome and recessed diamond patterns along the top. In contrast to the restrained Bahmani style, Krishnaraya's Kati Darwaza on the east side shows the more exuberant aesthetic that recalls the world of Vijayanagara. Thus, we find two Makura Toranas, those fabulous crocodiles, sculpted on the lintel above the arched opening. Now it is Vijayanagara's turn to adorn their gates with the same Chalukya period symbol that we saw already appearing in the postern in Bijapur. Clearly, both dynasties used their city gates to appeal to the memory of that earlier glorious dynasty, which had flourished 400 years earlier. We can guess what Krishnaraya might have placed above this Makara Torana by comparing the Katyadaraza with the other gateway that the king also built during Vijayanagara's 10-year occupation of the city. This was the Narangi Darwaza to the north, on the, you see at the top of the slide, which is an entirely new gate, gateway built in a part of the fort's northern wall where there had never been a gateway. It's also significant that it was the north wall that Krishnaraya chose to build this entirely new structure. For by building this gateway directly facing Bijapur, 
the king was adopting a confrontational stance vis-a-vis -vis his enemy to the north, whom he had just defeated and from whom he had seized this fort. This massive complex, the, the Norwangi Daraza, starts from an outer gateway, you see here, that is entirely Vijayanagara in spirit and style. Above its lintel is a panel with eight openings, flanked on either end by Makara Tornas, you see them here. And immediately above these is a frieze with sculpted elements from the Ramayana epic. Rama in the top center, and Hanuman Guda on the, on, the, on the sides. Now, comparing these two structures, it seems that the Kati and Naranga Darmazas were companion gateways, since the only difference between their outermost gateways is the presence of a Persian inscription that a Bijapur governor placed above the opening of the Kati Darmaza when the city swung back to Bijapur's control. That's the one on the, on the bottom here. While the Norangi Darwaza had little functional purpose as a passage leading to a major uh, roadway, it had enormous symbolic meaning, meaning. Passing through that outer gate into the inner courtyard, we enter something very different from the Chalukya world we encountered in the inner gate of Bijapur Citadel. Here we enter a, the world of the Ramayana epic. Uh, with which Krishnamaya was directly and very personally associated. For all around the courtyard's four walls is a frieze depicting images and scenes taken straight from that epic. Above all, uh, this majestic gateway presents us with a stage for Krishnamaya to enact his power and authority. Uh, amidst these scenes, right in the middle of the south wall, the wall opposing the great northern ga gateway, is a sculptured representation of Krishnaraya himself. You see it here. Viewers could hardly mistake the homology of the king and the god Rama, who is similarly depicted in these friezes. Rama on the top and Krishnaraya on the bottom. But we're not finished with this extraordinary gateway. Before moving into a third courtyard to the west of this large one, we have to pass through a raised structure dividing the two courtyards. Situated atop this structure is a jaroka, or a viewing platform, where the king himself would sit before those assembled in the courtyard below. Now, you recall the figures sculpted in the Narangi Darvaza's outermost passageway, in which the god Rama is depicted in the middle of the top panel, you see here, flanked by Garuda and Hanuman. Well, here, in the palace-like structure dividing the second and third courtyards, is an exact analog to the outermost gateway, with Hanuman and Garuda depicted in the side panels, and the Jaroka space for the king at the top. Courtiers or visitors in the courtyard below would then look up and see not the god Rama, but the living king, Krishnaraya himself. But in 1536, Vijayanagara again lost Raichur to Bijapur, and again we have some more facelifting. So here we are, again, at the city's outer, the, the other gateway, the Kati Davaza. And above the Makara Torla, uh, in Raichur's uh, Kati Davaza, we see a Persian inscription here, which the Bijapur governor, Shamsamok, installed by way of laying claim to the city. In this inscription, uh, in this inscription, the Bijapuri governor declared that he had, built, had been the builder of the entire entrance way, thereby erasing the recorded memory of Krishnaraya, who was the actual builder of the gate. Moreover, by replacing Krishnaraya's sculpted figures with this Persian inscription, the Kati Darvaza, as remodeled by Shamshira Mulk, revealed a key difference between Indic and Persian styles of self-representation. Whereas Krishnaraya had used only visual images in his doorways, the Bijapur governor uses inscriptions. Yet functionally, the two panels accomplish the same purpose. Both invoke the divine world and then summon the presence of the king, expressing hope for the defeat of their enemies. Finally, it is significant that Shamshira Mulk remodeled only the Kadya Davaza and left the Norwangi Davaza exactly as his dynastic enemy, the Vijayar king, had built it. The reason for this is very simple. 
unlike the Kati Darwaza, which had historically been the principal gate ent entrance to the city, the Norangi Darwaza leads nowhere. Look at this image here. Uh, now, there is a minor roadway leading from the, uh, the northern gateway into the city, but there are no historical monuments or important structures along it to the north, nothing there at all. On the other hand, all of Raichu's principal mosques and, 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 and palaces were built along the east-west road uh, leading through the Kati Davaza. That was the gateway that the people would see when entering or leaving the city. So that's the reason that Shamshiromuk wanted to address that particular gateway. So I want to make two general points before we take a break. First, as opposed to the conventional image of the Deccan as implacably divided between a Muslim north and a Hindu south, the city gates on both sides of the Krishna River reveal a merging of Persianate and Indic themes. The capital city of Bijapur, ruled by Muslim kings, proudly invoked its Chalukya past by prominently displaying in its principal gateway both inscriptions and columns that belonged to the Chalukya period, and a Makara Torana on one of its minor gates in the lower right. In one of their provincial cities, Kalyana, they went even further. Instead of transporting a Chalukya temple from somewhere else and installing it in their fort, they simply built their own palace and palace courtyard around a perfectly preserved entrance to a Chalukya temple sanctum that would have been built on the site some 600 years earlier. So here we are standing in the middle of uh, Bijapur's provincial town of Kalyana, its palace, and you can see the pointed archers, typical of, of a Persian palace. But the pointed arch on your left, which I've circled in red, will actually lead you right in front of a Chaloka period temple, which is in situ. It's not, it's not been moved. It has been preserved. So the palace has been built around this Chaloka temple. To the south, the kings of Vijayanagara, ruled by Hindu kings, did the same thing in their capital, displaying Chaloka columns in the mandapa opposite its most important temple. In fact, the kings of Vijayanagara went even further uh, in this respect as well. In the early 16th century, they actually relocated an entire Chalukya period water tank from some unknown site to the very heart of their capital, disassembling the original tank stone by stone, carefully numbering each one so that it could be correctly positioned in its new home. This would be rather like the founding fathers of the United States trying to identify with ancient Greece, simply transplanted the Parthenon from Athens to Washington, DC. Well, they didn't do that, we know. But they did the, best, the next best thing, which is to build a close approximation and then call it the Supreme Court building. On the other hand, the border town of Raichur shows a curious hybrid of Indic and Persianate forms. The outer gate above, you see here of the, of the Narangi Darwaza, uh, employs tribiated forms uh, in its lower levels, in the, in the bottom part, and the arcuated forms above. And most curiously, Krishnaraya, the Vijayanagara emperor who seized the city from Bijapur's control, is depicted in this gateway's courtyard, as we've seen, as an analog to the god Rama. Yet he is also wearing the characteristic headgear of contemporary Iranian royalty, which is the Persian kula, or as it's called in Telugu, kulai. It's interesting that not only the image of the kula has been absorbed in South India, but the very word, the, the Persian word kula, which means hat, ordinary, uh, now, has also been absorbed into the Telugu language as kulai. So the question I end with here is, uh, what, are we are to, what do we are to make of this image? Uh, who is he? Uh, are we looking at a Hindu Maharaja? Are we looking at a Persian prince? Or are we looking at both simultaneously? And finally, by the 16th century, Vijayanagara and Bijapur had begun articulating their authority and power in very different ways. In Vijayanagara, Krishnaraya emphasized the symbolism of power as seen in his powerful gateways and also in his courtyards, 
which served as a sort of stage for enacting his very theatrical symbolism of authority. However, while he was busy building his elaborate Norungi Darwaza to be used as a stage for performing uh, a purely symbolic sort of authority, Bijapur was busy working with the material side of power and doing this by building bigger and better cannons that would eventually bring down the Vijayanagara state itself. So this last observation takes us, or leads us, in a very different direction, a direction that turns from symbolism to the raw power that comes out of the muzzles of cannons, which is a topic that I want to turn to after our break. So, well, a very different way of looking at this contrast between the northern and southern Deccan uh, is through the medium of material culture, and more particularly, military technology, which might at first glance seem rather distant from art history. It is not. If battlefield outcomes are the ultimate tests of political power, the Battle of Raichur, fought in 1520 between Vijayanagara and Bijapur, was a turning point in the balance of power in the Deccan Plateau. Yet, curiously enough, this battle is almost entirely omitted from history books, even though it was the first battle in Indian history that saw the use of gunpowder. In fact, in some ways, this nearly unknown battle was one of the most significant battles in South Asian history, even world history, I will argue. Most textbooks date the introduction of gunpowder technology in India to the year 1526, when the Central Asian soldier, soldier of fortune and founder of the Mughal Empire, Babur, famously used cannon in defeating the last sultan of, Del of Delhi Sultanate uh, in the Battle of Panipat, 1526. But this ignores the earlier and far more important developments that took place in the Deccan Plateau. It's another instance of how North India seems to get all the press. <laughs> and the South is, and the Deccan is left out. And my, one of my missions in life is to get the Deccan Plateau uh, in people's consciousness. And here in the South is where a true military revolution occurred. And at a pace way ahead, not only of North India, but also ahead of Western Europe, which is usually said to have been the natural home of the so-called military revolution and the center of the worldwide diffusion of advanced gunpowder weaponry. One reason for this is topographical. Uh, North India's flat Indo-Gangetic plain is home to densely populated wheat or rice cultivating peasant communities. The key word here is flat, because any region having access to war horses, as any state controlling the Delhi region could expect to have, could fairly easily control this northern plain, the, the Hindustan plain, since the deployment of heavy cavalry gives easy access to surplus grain production. Such is what happened after the early 13th century, when rulers of the Delhi Sultanate amassed immense power by gaining control of the horse trade to the grasslands of Central Asia, recalling that Horses don't do very well in India. They don't reproduce very well. So they have to be constantly imported from outside, <clears throat> either from Central Asia or across the Arabian Sea from uh, Arabia. <clears throat> in the 16th century, the Mughal Empire would do the same thing. Such access enabled both states to monopolize the use of mounted archers who were garrisoned in strategic centers stretching from Kabul down to Lahore in the northwest all the way down to the Bengal Delta in the east. Likewise, whereas North India's broad and flat plain with ready access to Central Asia war horses favored the formation of large centralized states, it actually inhibited experimentation with gunpowder, a point that I'm going to return to in a moment. Now, to the south, on the other hand, the topography is very, very different. The entire Deccan Plateau is punctuated by hills that pop up from the plateau like islands in an archipelago. 
just going to show you a, just a visual tour quick of some of the extraordinary kinds of geology and topography that one finds. Uh, now, this is actually downtown Vijanagara, if you can believe it, looking at the Tungabhadra River uh, in the background. And I just want you to kind of absorb the different kind of geological forms, these styles of, as I say, hills uh, popping up out of a flat plateau, uh, which are natural sites for military fortifications. As you see here at Bidar in Karnataka, uh, Koilakonda in Andhra, uh, Shahpur, uh, virtually every hilltop in the whole Deccan Plateau has got uh, uh, forts that, that are rebuilt over the centuries, rebuilt, built, rebuilt, taken, retaken. In Maharashtra, uh, again back in uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, in Pongir, I mean, how would you like to take this fort uh, <laughs> up on top of this thing? Now these hills, composed of basalt, schist, granite, formed natural refuge areas for chieftains. They also favored the formation of small states that seized the control of these hills on which stone forts were built, especially from about the 12th century. Unlike flat North India, in the peninsula, the control of hill forts was the key to both state formation and state resistance. From such forts, governors or chieftains could control the surrounding agrarian countryside rather easily. Uh, for the purpose of besieging or defeat, defending these forts, cannon would be and was far more effective than cavalry, which might have been suitable for controlling the flat plains, but were nearly useless for seizing or holding forts atop rugged hills and amidst dense forests and ravines. The top, this topographical reality was one factor favoring interstate competition and hence experimentation, and especially with experimentation with cannon technology. Political factors also formed such experimentation, or favored such experimentation. Ever since the breakup of the Chalukya Empire back in the 12th century, the plateau was plunged into endemic interstate warfare. Not coincidentally, this was when stone forts began to appear both on the plains and on the hills of the Deccan. In the 14th century, the Delhi Sultans briefly dominated the Deccan as you see here in this map. And I, I want to point out that it had been the aspiration of many rulers of North India to conquer the entire South Peninsula, but it happened very seldom. Uh, this is only, what you see here, it was only about, what, 25 years, not even that, uh, when the Tughlaq dynasty of Delhi uh, briefly occupied the Deccan Plateau. Um, <clears throat> but once again, when their power receded in the mid-14th century, the area once again fell back to interstate rivalries, especially between Delhi's two great successor states in the Deccan that we talked about earlier, uh, the Bahmanese of the northern Deccan and Vijayanagara in the south. Between 1362 and 1512, the kings of these two states fought 12 major wars over control of the rich sliver of land stretching along the central Deccan known as the Raichur Doa that I spoke of earlier. It was such pre-existing rivalries that provided the incentive for discovering new and more effective military technologies. This then was the topographical and political environment in which several key battles were fought. The first was a pair of naval confrontations that took place off the coast of Western India at Chaul in 1508 and then in Diu the next year. Both battles pitted the newly arrived Portuguese against a coalition of enemies, the Ottomans, the Mamluks of Egypt, the Sultan of Gujarat, and the Maharaja of Calicut, way down in the south. The coalition won the first engagement at Chaul, but the Portuguese won the second at Diu. But significantly, both battles catalyzed the development of gunpowder technology that was already taking place along the western coast, especially in the port city of Goa. This st strategic port, before it was taken over by the Portuguese, and of course made the center of Portuguese power in the entire Indian Ocean, before that, it was held by the sultans of Bijapur, uh, which only a dec decade earlier had emerged as one of the several successor states to the Bahmani Sultanate. 
Although Portuguese historians might believe that they had been the ones who brought gunpowder technology to India, uh, along with tobacco, chili pepper, potatoes, and so forth, firearms were being used in Western India well before the rise of the Portuguese. Gaspar Correa, uh, Correa, secretary of the first Portuguese viceroy, wrote that in 1502, Portuguese naval squadrons were bombarded from a hilltop overlooking the port of Padkal. In the, on the map here. In 1504, the Italian traveler Ludovico de Vartema recorded seeing artillery at the port of Chaul, just south of modern Bombay. Shortly after the battles of Chaul and Diu, the son of the Portuguese viceroy, Albuquerque, noted that Bijapuri defenders at Goa greeted the European invaders with artillery fire. Now, how had this technology evolved? According to a document published by Gaspar Correa, who was on the spot, at the time the Portuguese conquered Goa in 1510, in Goa there were already, and I'm quoting him here, there were already large houses with storage space which the Muslims had filled with all the materials necessary for shipbuilding and lots of iron and mortar artillery, large and small, and also two of our camel cannons and eight cradles and mortars which the Muslims had brought with them from the defeat uh, at Chaul in 1508. So here we see one vector of transmission. In 1508, the coalition's fleet had defeated the Portuguese squadron off the port of Chaul, as a result of which Muslims had confiscated Portuguese cannon and mortars and taken them to Goa. A similar thing happened the next year after the Battle of Diu. The, the Portuguese historian Duarte Barbosa, who was in India at this time, wrote that Bijapur's authorities in Goa received Turkish escapees from that battle. The Turks were resettled in Goa with the help of Muslim merchants who financed the building of shipyards and plants for the manufacture of iron and copper ordnance. In other words, if the first naval engagement with the Portuguese led to the transfer of Portuguese cannon technology into Bijapur, the second one led to the transfer of Turkish gunners and gunsmiths into the same territory. These Turks had brought to the Goa arsenal the very latest Ottoman gun technology. Moreover, this technology was blended with technologies that were already known, producing exceptionally good weapons. Albuquerque himself, this is the viceroy uh, in, in Goa, Albuquerque was so impressed with Goa's gun-making tradition that he sent to the king of Portugal samples of the heavy cannon used by Muslims of that city. In 1513, the Viceroy reported that matchlocks manufactured by Goa's master gunsmiths were as good as those made in Bohemia. He even sent one of those gunsmiths, one of those Muslim gunsmiths, to Lisbon to work for the, to work for the Portuguese crown. Several years later, Albuquerque went further and reported that Muslim gunsmiths who had formerly served Bijapur but were induced to return to Goa after the Portuguese conquered the city they were capable of turning out iron cannon and matchlocks of a higher quality than anything even produced in Germany, which was then considered the source of Europe's finest guns. Needless to say, such details are never found in Western civilization textbooks, which invariably glorify the primacy of European technology and presume that technology transfers were, in, were on a one-way transmission belt from Europe to the rest of the world. From 1513 on, then, a tradition of German and Bohemian gun making brought to India by the Portuguese merged with Turkish gun making traditions that were already present in Goa, producing what has been called an Indo Portuguese tradition of matchlocks. So, what you see here is kind of a genealogy of matchlock technology. Don't want to get too technical here, uh, but the important point is that on the right, uh, you see the, the, the merging of these various traditions that were then passed on from India. Uh, to Japan uh, and the Malay Peninsula and even and Sri, and Sri Lanka. These weapons, considered, in, in, that is the Indo-Portuguese, manufactured in Goa, were considered at the time to be the su superior to anything produced anywhere in India or even in Europe, uh, which is why they spread so swiftly throughout the rest of Asia. There's a, there's a close up of, of one of those contemporary matchlocks, and here's an actual tapestry showing Portuguese fidalgos in Goa 
uh, using in the, in the mid-16th century, using those same kinds of weapons. So the naval battles at Chowell and Dew created important vectors for both European and Turkish gunpowder technology to reach coastal India. Now the Battle of Raichur, 1520, was the first battle in the interior of India where gunpowder played any kind of role. As we saw before the break, the town and fort of Raichur is located in the middle of the richest and most contested tract in the entire peninsula, the Raichur Doab, you see here. And as I mentioned earlier, Bahmani and Vijayanagara kingdoms had fought 12 wars here between 1362 and 1512. By the latter date, the Bahmani kingdom had dis disintegrated and was succeeded by five new successor states, the largest of which was Bijapur, which had already been developing gunpowder technology before the Portuguese showed up in 1510. Of course, they continued to do so after that date. Bijapur, was, Bijapur also inherited from the Bahmani predecessor the old rivalry with Vijayanagara to the south. The difference being, uh, the difference between the Battle of Raichur of 1520 and previous contests over the area was that this time, one side of the conflict, Bijapur, had well-developed tradition of gun manufacturing, thanks to its experimentation at Goa before the Portuguese arrived in 1510. On the other hand, Bijapur's opponent, Vijayanagara to the south, made no significant use of gunpowder in that battle of 1520. And yet, contrary to what might expect, it was Vijayanagara that won that battle, not Bijapur. And that is why, in my opinion, this battle is virtually is never mentioned by historians. I'm sorry to tell you that when an, if any event that violates our deeply ingrained assumptions about causality, historians typically just shove it under the rug and ignore it. But as I also mentioned before the break, Vijayanagara's most famous king, Krishnaraya, picked a fight with Bijapur in 1520 and invaded Raichur, which he and his predecessors had long coveted. At the time, the fort of Raichur was under the control of the Bijapur Sultan, Ismail Adil Khan. Krishnaraya's invasion forces included 28,000 cavalry and many more infantry. For its part, Raichur was defended with two strong walls of heavy masonry made without lime, uh, without lime mortar and packed with earth inside, with bastions projecting into a moat, as you see here. Atop the bastions were 30 stone-hurling catapults, and along the curtain walls were 200 heavy cannon with many smaller cannon fixed into gun ports, which is what you see here. The narrow slits are, are loopholes for, for, uh, for guns, for handheld guns, and the square ones are for, for cannon. This is the earliest recorded use of cannon on forts in the Indian interior. Though the continued use of catapults and bastions shows that the defensive use of cannon was only just beginning. Garrisoned inside the fort, were 800 uh, Bijapuri infantry, 400 cavalry, and 20 war elephants. This is one of those gun ports that, that, that was you see, it's very square. Although the fort was heavily defended with cannon, the besiegers had no artillery at all against Raichur's walls. Instead, Krishnaraya uh, ordered his soldiers and actually gave them monetary inducements to dismantle the walls with crowbars and pickaxes paying them in sums proportionate to the number and size of the stones they could dismantle from the, from the fort. Then in early May 1520, while the siege was in progress, Krishnaraya learned that Ismail Khan of Bijapur had marched down to relieve the embattled fort and was camped on the northern side of the Krishna River. With him were 18,000 cavalry, 120,000 infantry, 150 war elephants, and a great deal of artillery. Suspending the siege at Raichur, Krishnaraya then moves up his entire army to the Krishna River in order to prevent Bijapur's forces from crossing and coming down to Raichur. The two armies then clashed in a pitched battle May 19, 1520. The Sultan, having moved his forces to the southern bank of the river, fired all of his artillery at once into Vijayanagara's massed front lines. But Krishnaraya's remaining cavalry were able to counterattack before Ismail's men could reload their cannon. Indeed, 
they drove the Bijapuris back toward and finally into the Krishna River. A huge slaughter occurred by the river, in the midst of which Ismail, the, the sultan, jumped on an elephant and barely escaped with his life. Amidst this hasty retreat, Ismail's retreating army had to abandon 400 heavy cannon and 90, 900 gun carriages in addition to 4,000 war horses and 100 elephants. Having soundly defeated the Bijapuris on the battlefield, Bijanagara's army returns to Raichur to resume their siege of the fort. Showing that we are now witnessing the very dawn of gunpowder in this part of the world, a contemporary Portuguese observer noted that the defenders of this fort, quote, up to then had never seen men killed with firearms nor any other such weapon, unquote. What's more, although the Bijapuris had fixed cannon along its curtain wall, this new firepower proved hopelessly ineffective against the besieging army of Vijanagara, which continued to assault the fort's walls with crowbars and pickaxes. The reason for this ineffectiveness by the defenders with their cannon lay in the manner in which their cannon were mounted. Being placed high on the curtain walls, they could not fire down on, the dismantle, on those who were dismantling the walls at their base. I mean, every cannonball that was fired out of one of these cannons would land in the same predictable spot. All you had to tell your, your, your besiegers was don't go to that spot uh, and, and you'll, you'll be just fine. Extraordinarily ineffective. Um, so these fixed cannon, which had no swivels, uh, were totally immobile and hence quite useless against the besiegers below. The only evidence of the use of gunpowder on Vijanagara's side was the presence of Portuguese mercenary matchlockmen who were among them, the, the uh, Krishna, Krishna Raya's crowd. In fact, one such sniper, Portuguese sniper, managed to shoot and kill the governor of, of the fort, which so sapped the morale of, of Raichur's defenders that they abandoned the wall. The next day, the Bijapurs surrendered the whole fort, allowing Krishna Raya to ride through the gates in triumph. Now, the battle's outcome is therefore completely counterintuitive. The side using gunpowder actually lost the battle. On the other hand, the Battle of Panipat in North India, which Babur uh, won six years later, uh, thereby launching the Mughal Empire, is often seen as having inaugurated India's gunpowder age. For he had cannon, and he won the battle. But the outcome of the two battles at Raichur, both at the riverside and at the fort, point us to a very important lesson. That is, that states normally assimilate new technologies by a gradual process of trial and error, in respect of which failures can be as important as successes. A principal cause of Ismail's crushing defeat by the banks of the river lay in his gunner's inability to quickly reload and fire successive rounds of shot before being overwhelmed by Vijanagara's swift and powerful cavalry. Much had to be learned about the manufacture and deployment of field cannon, and considerable practice would be necessary before this new technology could become truly lethal to opponents who had already mastered cavalry warfare. Moreover, Ismail was probably the first to mount cannon on the battlements of any fort in, the, in India. But the technology's very novelty proved its user's undoing. Because his cannons were fixed along the curtain walls in immobile positions, Krishnaraya's men were able to dismantle the walls of the fort without suffering too many casualties. In short, Bijapur's deployment of gunpowder technology, both at the fort uh, and by the river uh, were, were flawed. Even more importantly, the two sides of this conflict drew opposite lessons from the battle's outcome. Krishnaraya, while impressed with the matchlocks used by his Portuguese mercenaries, failed to see cannon warfare as the wave of the future. Prevailing against Bijapur's artillery, both in the pitch battle and at the fort, apparently affirmed his confidence in the efficacy of the day's conventional warfare, which is cavalry warfare. Moreover, there's no evidence that he followed up his victories by establishing an arsenal or founding a, a, establishing a foundry in his kingdom. Uh, 
nor did he or his successors ever mount cannon on the walls of their forts. Now here you're looking at some of the walls at Vijanagara. Clearly there's no effort to put cannon anywhere on these, on these walls. Um, <clears throat> Bijapur, on the other hand, drew precisely the opposite lesson from their two defeats at Raichur. Rather than abandon the technology that had failed them, they went on a binge of experimentation. Throughout the rest of the 16th century, they not only continued to recruit master gunsmiths from the Ottoman domains, as they had been doing in Goa, they also experimented aggressively with European and Turkish artillery design, pioneering new techniques of gun manufacture and cannon mounting that had no precedent anywhere in the world. Cannon dating to the 1550s, now lying atop forts all over the Deccan Plateau, reveal how Bijapur's engineers took European features such as the trunnion and the swivel fork and ingeniously incorporated them into the making of large swivel cannons measuring up to seven or even nine meters in length. So here you see one of the small one meter Portuguese breech loaders called bersos that were built in Europe for use on shipboard. But here in the Deccan, it, the same weapon was adapted for use on curtain walls and resting on a swivel, and the swivel uh, was exactly like the ones that you would see on any rowboat. You think back to your days rowing boats in, in on, uh, you know, your childhood, okay? The, you, the way the swivel works and, you, and the lower part is, is plugged into the gunnels of, of the rowboat. Uh, well, the same thing's happening in the case of these swivel cannons. You see how uh, this smaller uh, Portuguese adapted weapon is used to swivel back and forth. And notice how we've moved from a square gun port to a trapezoidal gun port, allowing uh, this gun to swivel from right to left. Um, unlike the square gun ports that they had earlier. The next step, taken, also taken in the 1550s, was to apply the same principle of huge guns uh, that were now mounted on corner bastions. The first step in this direction was made by expanding on traditions of Ottoman gunsmiths, as seen in this fine bronze cannon in neighboring Avonnugger, cast in 1543. Uh, now, the trunnions on either side of this Ottoman imported cannon would have been mounted on a portable wooden carriage permitting the cannon to be raised or lowered. So you can see how that with the trunnion in the middle, you could move this thing up or down. Uh, but being fixed in its carriage, the gun still could not move laterally. The big breakthrough occurred in the next decade, again by Bijapur. On their fort at Yadgir, we find five cannons fixed on corner bastions. On this one, we can see the nature of the breakthrough. The trunnion, this cannon right here, uh, about 1550. The trunnion is fixed not in the middle of the barrel, but on the bottom of the barrel, and it is fitted into a big granite block so that the whole block can swivel, uh, so that the cannon can swivel up and down. Now, to figure out how it moved laterally, I climbed down under this mounting block to photograph the iron peg on which the mounting block pivots uh, on top of the gun platform. So there's that little piece of iron down there underneath the big granite block. So that now the gun can move both up and down and uh, laterally to the right and left. So the result of this was the world's first large swivel cannon ever mounted on a bastion. Then, in the 1560s, Bijapur's engineers started building two-tiered bastions. The, the, uh, you've got this large lower bastion you see in front of you, but then there's an upper bastion on the top that was built with a, with a recoil wall and adapted for swivel cannons. So we're looking at that same uh, upper level from the top. Um, these were mounted not on a granite block, as at Yadgir, but on a forked yoke permitting both vertical and lateral movement, as you see here. At the same time, the cannon manufacturer technique advanced from using crude forged iron technique to cast bronze, which we also see here. So here we see, this is about 1555, and only about 10 years later, you can see the enormous advance that had been made in just about a decade of time. So in sum, they combined the Yadgir type of, cannon, of, of gun mount with the iron swivel mount 
earlier introduced by the Portuguese, but obviously on a much larger scale. This is all the Deccan. In North India, by contrast, the Mughal Empire was still fixing cannon in battlements, as we see uh, in miniature paintings like this one from the early 17th century. Uh, or they were firing their cannon from gun carriages, again, from the early 17th century. So as you can clearly see, uh, neither of these techniques in, in North India, among the Mughal Empire, gave the gunners very much maneuverability. The sweeping advances in military technology made by Bijapur also required drastic modifications of their forts. For example, to solve the problem of recoil, recoil shearing off the mounting pins, engineers built sturdy recoil walls behind the breach of the cannons. Again, back here. The new mounting system was placed inside new structures called cavaliers, which were built inside and on top of modernized bastions. And in forts that were not perched atop hills, in order to gain the advantage of height, Bijapur's engineers built huge mounting structures that would dominate the entire countryside. One of these we see in Naldurk, built around 1560. This huge cavalier is 88 feet high, 65 feet in diameter, and 77 steps leading up to the very top. On top of this cavalier, uh, they would have had one or two big, here two, big swivel cannons, which would have full 360 degree coverage of the surrounding landscape. What is more, these changes taking place in India were way ahead of what was happening anywhere in the world. As late as 1755, French engineers in Fort Ticonderoga, upstate New York, many of you have been there, were still mounting cannons on wheeled wooden carriages and fixing them behind curtain walls with their muzzles poking through gun ports, similar to what Bijapur defenders at Raichur had done more than 300 years earlier. All of this experimentation and innovation was happening in the northern Deccan, mainly in Bijapur, whose defeat at Raichur in 1520 had spurred them on to embark on a frenzied drive for military improvement. But none of this was happening in the south, in Vijayanagara, whose rulers had been lulled into smug self-confidence after their victory of 1520. They therefore remained complacent and resistant to modification of their military infrastructure. As a result, a huge gap opened between the military technology of Bijapur and that of its old opponent to the south. Consequently, when the two sides met again in battle at, at Talikota, you see here, in 1565, the results were catastrophic for Vijayanagara, whose great capital, at the time one of the world's largest cities, was totally destroyed and the state itself virtually annihilated. The famous Battle of Talakota was decided by the effective deployment of field cannon by Bijapur and its allies, Ahmednagar and Golconda, who linked together three rows of artillery with chains and placed them at the front of the center. The first row of artillery consisted of heavy cannon, the second of light cannon, and the third of swivel cannon. Several thousand archers were also used, but only to mask the artillery and to lure Vijayanagara's advancing forces toward the cannon. When those forces reached close range, the gunners loaded bags of copper coins in the cannon, which, when fired, devastated the entire advancing army, like shrapnel, killing 5,000 close to the gun's muzzles. A contemporary Persian historian, Ferrashta, writes, and I'm quoting him here, the repulse of this charge seems to have decided the fate of the day. Clearly, ever since the Battle of Raichur, Vijayanagara had fallen way behind its northern neighbors in terms of artillery development. Now, several points emerge from this discussion. First, the diffusion of gunpowder technology between Europe and Asia was not a one-way street. Turkish gunmakers under Bijapur's auspices had already been employed in Goa's gun foundry prior to the advent of Portuguese power in India. Albuquerque, upon seizing Goa in 1510, recognized the superior quality of Indian guns and even sent samples and local engineers off to Portugal. Engineers in Goa then combined German and Turkish gun making, making traditions, resulting in the production at Goa's gun foundry of the hybridized Indo-Portuguese matchlock, which then diffused into the interior and throughout Asia. Clearly, 
Challenging the old story we've always heard, technology in the early modern and modern era did not diffuse only from Europe, with non-Europeans playing the role of passive recipients of such technologies. Second, the peculiar topography of the Deccan, with its many hills rising above the plateau, had for centuries encouraged the building of hill forts as a means of controlling the surrounding countryside. In contrast to North India's broad, flat plain. Consequently, over time, inhabitants of the Deccan came to conceive of power itself in terms of the ability to hold and seize and defend high ground. This not only resulted in the construction of hill forts in the pre-gunpowder era, uh, which appear on virtually every prominent hill in the Deccan Plateau, it also encouraged experimentation with cannon technology and rebuilding their bastions with a particular purpose in mind, namely to control the countryside below. And they did so in ways that in some respects surpassed Turkish or European models of the day. But one might rightly ask, why, if the southern Deccan was just as hilly as the northern Deccan, why did such gunpowder technology develop only in the north and not in the south? Reason lay in the very different lessons that participants at the Battle of Raichur drew from the outcome of that earlier conflict. Victory at Raichur in 1520 had lulled Vijayanagara into a state of complacency. During the entire period from 1520 to the city's final destruction, 1565, the walls of Vijayanagara itself, together with all of its other forts in the southern Deccan, remained without bastions and without gun mounts for cannon. The contrast between the fortification you see here at Bijanagara and the fortification at Bijapur is simply striking. It was Bijapur's defeat in 1520 that catalyzed the state to embark on a headlong drive for, in military modernization. In the end, it was a combination of the, of the Deccan's hilly topography and its response to its earlier defeat at Raichur that drove Bijapur's engineers to pioneer these novel technologies. And third, these military developments, and specifically the Battle of Talakota, had a profound impact on cultural production across the plateau. In the south, after the Battle of Talakota, cultural production ceased altogether, owing to Vijayanagara's defeat in that battle. But for the five sultanates of the northern Deccan, this sudden reduction in interstate warfare had important cultural consequences, as seen in the domains of literature, architecture, and art. This can be demonstrated by noting an extraordinary coincidence in the timing of three apparently distinct phenomena, all of which cluster around the mid-16th century. One of these is the dramatic increase in the construction of new bastions, which is very clear in the diagram at top, where you can see the along top, uh, you know, from the beginning of the 16th century through about 1555, only one or at the most two bastions were remodeled uh, in any one decade. But in the 30 years after 1555, 35 such bastions were built, which is that big spike you see in the upper right-hand side. Moreover, we see in the left side of the lower half of the, of the slide that in the first half of the century, forts were changing hands rather often. I've, I've chosen the five most contested forts, Paranda, Sholapur, Naldrug, Kalyana, and Bidar, to illustrate this. But from the middle of that century, as you see from the same chart, once these new improved fortifications were built, with their long-range cannon built on the bastions, forts virtually ceased to change hands. Only one fort changed hands after 1559, you see here. The reason for this is clear. As modernized forts began to appear across the plateau, the balance of military advantage tipped from attackers to defenders. Besieging armies found it difficult or impossible to seize reconstituted forts, which thereafter virtually ceased changing hands. For the first time since the emergence of the five sultanates in the early 16th century, the Deccan's internal frontiers became stable. And as this occurred, the cultural production of the northern sultanates grew in quantity and became more differentiated in quality. Shortly after the Battle of Talakota, 
the Nizam Shahi Sultanate of Amunagar saw a surge of cultural production, beginning with an illustrated chronicle, the Tarif of Hussein Shahi, that narrated the famous Battle of Talakota. The reign of Murtaza Nizam Shah, again of Amunagar, uh, there appeared architectural gems, such as what you see here, the Damri Mosque, built in 1568, with, uh, uh, delicately carved from brown-gray basalt. Uh, he also patronized the elegant Farah Bakhsh Bagh pavilion. And in the reign of Sultan Burhan Nizam Shah, 1591 to uh, 1595, uh, a new and distinctive school of drawing appeared using simple ink and line drawing, combined with technical effects like stippling and shading. That ruler also patronized the first history of, of the Nizam Shahi dynasty, that's the dynasty of Amunagar, called the Burhani Masir, which reflects an awareness of Amunagar's distinct identity among the Deccan states. Cultural production of Bijapur, like that in Amunagar, did not peak until the later 16th century and continued well into the 17th century. Miniature painting came into its own there with the striking illustrations of the Nijum al an extraordinary text composed in 1570 by Bijapur's sultan himself. Whether in architecture, literature, music, or painting, Sultan Ibrahim II of Bijapur witnessed that state's high point in cultural production. Ibrahim was also the author, having composed, uh, having composed a book on music, the Kitab al Norris, which reveals his eclectic religious sensibilities and his personal devotion to Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of literature and art. It was in the latter half of the 17th century, too, that Bijapuri architecture evolved a distinctive style that included broad arches, domes, carved lintel petals around their drums, delicate plaster work, finely carved brackets, bulbous turrets, and relief ornaments featuring pendants from stone chains. Outstanding examples include Muhammad Adil Shah's Gul Gumbaz, which you see here, uh, but perhaps most remarkably, the famous Ibrahim Rosa, which was Sultan Ibrahim II's uh, sumptuously carved tomb complex. The same pattern holds true for other Deccani sultanates. Uh, in Bidar, in the center of the plateau, Sultan Ali Barid Shah patronized the construction of the Rangin Mahal, uh, which means colored palace, in the heart of uh, the, the, the former Bahmani court. Adorning this structure's arch is inlaid mother of pearl worked into polished black basalt, an aesthetic that prefigured the production of bidri ware. Now, bidri ware is a kind of metalwork in which sheets of silver or brass floral or geometric motifs were inlaid into a blackened alloy of zinc and copper. This craft work was singularly associated with Bidar, after which it was named Bidri Ware, and was used for trays, incense burners, basins, and especially for water pipes or hookahs. In the easternmost sultanate of Golconda, still in the northern Deccan, Ibrahim Qutub Shah cultivated and promoted a distinctively regional culture informed by Telugu language, Telugu being the regional language of, of his sultanate in the east, and also Telugu literature, uh, and a, a revived consciousness of Tele Telangana's past history. He patronized the construction of large tanks for storing water from dammed up streams, which were essential for sustaining agriculture in the dry upland eastern plateau. This was a practice that stretched all the way back to the region's Kakatiya kings, who ruled in the 12th and 14th century. Kakadiya traditions also found expression in the layout of the Qutub Shari's greatest legacy to subsequent history, which is the city of Hyderabad itself, with its incomparable gem, the Charminar, Minaret, Charminar Monument, which you see here. At the same time, for their mosques and tombs, these kings evolved a style that included nearly spheroid domes with the forms of, of lotus petals at their base, plaster and carved stone, and minarets with miniaturized bulbous domes, almost as if these, these domes and minarets were imitating vegetative styles like, like buds and, 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 and so forth. So to conclude all of this, by the 1570s and 1580s, newly designed forts, and this is my basic argument the whole lecture, 
By the 1570s and 80s, newly designed forts had given defenders a strategic advantage over, over besiegers in each of the sultanates of northern Deccan. This, in turn, lowered the level of interstate warfare, froze interstate boundaries, and allowed the sultanates to devote their energies not to warfare, but to patronizing cultural projects that were both distinctive and remarkable. I would therefore end by urging the necessity of incorporating into our understanding of art and architecture the insights and methods of other disciplines, even those disciplines that are apparently as remote as military technology or topography or, of course, political history. Combining these resources might give us, I believe, a more holistic perception of the past and how that past evolved into the present day. Thank you very much.